Good morning, good morning. God bless you all. Welcome. <clears throat> Start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, thank you. Thank you, Father, so much for this time to look in your word. Help me with this lesson, Lord, that I can be, uh, uh, be a great lesson for us all to help to understand uh, what you find uh, beneficial and not beneficial when it comes to our dealings with each other. We give you praise and thanks for all you do. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, I was uh, finishing up that last chapter, verses 20 and 21, and we, we uh, met a, a person that uh, we've seen a couple of times through, uh, through this story, Miriam, the prophetess. And uh, for some reason, the Holy Spirit, I felt like doing a short excerpt about her life, particularly because of an incident that happened that we'll get into here in a minute. And I think it's because it hit me a little bit as something that uh, God used in my life to, uh, not not directly, uh, not exactly, but in a way where uh, he used uh, illness to bring me back into the reality of who he is and not to question uh, some of the things that I was questioning at that time. And I, and I see a lot of this in Miriam when she uh, comes to a confrontation with, uh, with her brother Moses and, uh, and how God reacts to it. And I can see now it, it helped me to understand maybe a little bit more about my own life. So I thought I'd share it anyways. Uh, I just felt led to, too. The Holy Spirit kind of like really put it on my heart. So we're taking a little bit of an exit from this particular part of the, this story and we're going to look at Miriam. We're going to see her again later on, because uh, the, the part, the main part, I'm going to be talking about is actually in Numbers. So it happens much later after Exodus it even happens. But to, just to kind of look at her life real quick and see how, uh, and why was she called a prophetess? That's another part I want to kind of touch base on. So let me get some verses up here. And. I found this picture too. I got, I kind of uh, took me a minute to figure out <clears throat> what it was saying, but it kind of fits uh, for today a little bit about God and uh, the power that God has and how how we're supposed to deal with Him. <clears throat> So we use this the backdrop today in this picture here. You can see it lightly written here. It says God right here in the middle of this. And this is the three, the trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, I, I, and that's a powerful message since we'll be talking primarily about God today. And, of course, his dealings with Miriam, Moses, and Aaron. And in this picture here, we got Moses over here. This is kind of like a, maybe a little bit symbology of the life uh, leading up to the tabernacle, which you see over on the side here. This is from a paintings done on the, on, the, on Moses. And the name of this particular painting is called The Greatest Commandment, which happens to be uh, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and love thy neighbor as thyself. So uh, it might be uh, just felt fitting for this particular episode. So I want to talk about Moses' sister a little bit. Quite a, quite a bit is mentioned about her as a... Uh, uh, Women don't really show, show have a pre predominant role in the Bible. <laughs> There's, of course, some beautiful women that are spoken of, but it's not like uh, we don't usually get a lot of detail about a woman. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, we don't get a lot of detail about uh, her background, her, her childhood, or anything like that. <clears throat> we can probably you know, summarize everything we know about Mary in just a few few verses. Uh, we know she had a cousin named Elizabeth, uh, and uh, uh, of course she was in, endowed to be married to Joseph, and she's the mother of our Lord. But other than that, and a few other times in the Bible, she's not spoken of a lot. So whenever you see a detail on a woman in the Bible, it's kind of a, a unique situation where they were the really predominant. I don't believe God, God put everything in the Bible for a reason. And none of it is fluff. That's uh, it's all there for a reason. We just have to try to figure out what it is. 
So let's get some verses in here. Miriam the prophetess, and I'm just going to read the two verses I'm basing this on first, and then we'll go into more detail about what I'm, why I'm, uh, I'm doing this lesson. Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Remember where we left off Friday is that uh, they had come to the Red Sea, and right now they're on the banks uh, on the uh, on the uh, Saudi Arabian side, free from the uh, tyranny of, uh, of, of uh, bondage in uh, Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh and his army have been destroyed. So they're really in celebration right now. <clears throat> and Miriam is leading the, uh, uh, leading the uh, women's choir, more or less, uh, by the, the singing and the dancing to the Lord. So that's what we see in this particular two verses. This has got me curious about it, is that uh, uh, you can see her leading. And uh, we first again met uh, but what, uh, part of the, what we're going to be looking at today is that there, uh, in Numbers, there's a confrontation between her, Aaron, and God over this seemingly sin of discrimination of Moses' wife. And that's what I wanted to lead to. Lots of great things are also said of her. So I thought it would be a good lesson on our own self. Sinful flesh sometimes uh, can really hurt our testimony. Uh, she did a lot of great things. And there's one thing God had to kind of teach her a lesson. Uh, and that's uh, and that's the part that hit me. Uh, that, uh, I truly, truly believe that my testimony, uh, uh, and that I've been a Christian since I was, I accepted the Lord when I was 13. Uh, but I really backslid bad. Uh, I, I did a lot of things I'm not proud of through my uh, uh, time in the military, mainly uh, leading up to almost uh, about seven years ago. The Lord grabbed me by the, uh, by the nap of the neck and gave me a, a period of time. I think this is what hit me, because when we get to this story, I'll share a little bit more. But uh, I never correlated the fact that my particular uh, period of time that I was in deep agony over what was happening to me medically was seven days. And so uh, that's, I think that's what stuck with me about this. Because that was, I was digging more into Miriam as a person is when I found this passage in Numbers. But let's do the lead up first. So I want to I I kind of show her, uh, her good side and then this small negative side and how she recouped from that negative side uh, and was able to come back up. Uh, Again, into the uh, into the glory of the Lord. So Mary, uh, so Miriam's a prophetess, the son of Aaron. This is the first mention of Miriam by name, and she is described as a sister of Aaron. So she is therefore also the sister of Moses. Uh, we see that in Exodus four fourteen. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, "Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother?" So you see here, Moses ties himself to Aaron as his brother. I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. This verse here tells us two things. One thing, Moses, I, I get the impression that Moses was not uh, a real forceful person. Uh, he was somebody that really uh, enjoyed uh, controlling people, you know, being a leader by example more than by his words or by uh, uh some people would call him somewhat meek and mild-mannered uh, in his approach to life. And that's part of the reason that uh, uh, he was complaining with God in this particular verse here, that he couldn't, he, he didn't think he had the, the ability to be able to set the people free. So that's when Aaron uh, came into the picture, and Aaron became his spokesman. But God was kind of upset, and Moses at this point, because uh, he, uh, he felt that Moses could do it, but he wasn't willing to. So he got Aaron to help. But that at least tells us that Aaron and Moses are brothers. I'm jumping over to the numbers, 2659. And the name of Amram's wife was Joabed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt. And she bare unto Amram, Aaron and Moses and Miriam, their sister. 
couple of things here we see is number one, we find out who the parents are of these three siblings. Uh, we see we see the birth, or, uh, and we also find out that uh, through the uh, through this story that Moses is the baby of the family, and Miriam and Aaron are older than them, and we're not sure which one's the oldest. I have a feeling it's Miriam uh, is the oldest, because even Aaron sometimes sounds like uh, in the conversation and numbers we're going to see that Miriam seems to be in control of the conversation more so than Aaron is. This also indicates, as it says here, Miriam, their, their sister. Uh, it's uh, singular, and uh, uh, the fact that there, it looks like they only had one sister. So that most likely this person we're talking about here, uh, that we're talking about back when uh, Miriam helped Moses get saved by the uh, Egyptian, uh, the, the, uh, oh, the daughter of Pharaoh. We do know that it was his sister who supervised the launching of the basket onto the Nile River to preserve his life. And that's back in Exodus 2, 3 through 9. And we'll read through that right now. And when she could no longer hide him, this is by Moses' mother, she took him for took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river brink. Flags is the... Uh, is that uh, growing, uh, we used to uh, believe uh, we called it a cat and nine tails. Uh, it kind of grows up uh, near uh, any kind of a water source and has this uh, an interesting top to the top of it. Uh, almost a little, looks a little bit like a hot dog sticking on top of a, a stick. <laughs> and his sister stood afar off to wit. Uh, what would be done to him. So uh, what we're saying here is this was Miriam. So this is where we first uh, find out about her. And here she is walking down the riverbed, uh, following the basket as it floats down the uh, River Nile. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walk along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the, the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she opened it, she, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter. So here we got Mary. Miriam is really bold. She's walking up to Pharaoh's daughter as a Hebrew slave. I got to tell you, she's got some guts. Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women? So she's going to offer to go get some help to take care of the child. Well, of course, she goes and gets her mother. Continuing here in verse 7, that she may nurse the child for thee. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee the way, thy wages. She's even getting paid for it. That's, that's awesome. That's God at work. And the women took the child and nursed it. So that's the first time we meet Miriam. And now we find out what her name is here uh, in, uh, in chapter 15. So based on Numbers 26, 59, we can say this was probably most, almost certainly Miriam. She was the older sister of Moses. And quite a bit older because he was a baby and she was definitely, uh, you know, she was old enough to be walking along the riverbank and down and, and talking to the pharaoh. So she's probably a good oh, 10 or 11 years older than her, than, that, than him. So speaking of Miriam the prophetess, to some other women that, that also hold that honor, so it's not, it's not only her. Uh, I thought I'd mention a few others of interest. I guess, uh, I guess really I skipped the verse. Oh, well, I already read it. 2659. Yeah, I already read it. I was going to reread it, but that's okay. Uh, so in Judges 4.4, 4, uh, this would be Deborah. She was actually a judge. Uh, I, I bet during that period of time for a woman to be a judge, uh, probably a little bit like Judge Judy, huh? Uh, probably uh, really stern, uh, good good on the bench. But uh, Judges 4.4, 4, and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of uh, Labadeoth, she judged Israel at that time. Another one over in 1 Samuel 10, 5. 
After that, there shall come to the hill of God. Of course, that's always there in Jerusalem, uh, Mount Zion, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass, when thou art come hither uh, to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with psalmetry and tabret and pipe and harp before them, and they shall prophesy. This is most likely women uh, because of the uh, playing the music. It may not be. It might be a man, too. Second Kings 22.14 So Hedekiah the priest and Haakim and Archibor and Shaphan and Asahiah went unto Hudila the prophetess. There's another prophetess. The wife of Shalom, the son of uh, Tigban, the son of Harvahas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college and they communed with her. So again, I'm just pointing out some other other women prophetess. So it wasn't like she was the only one. And then one in, jumping into the New Testament in Luke 2.36. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Anul and the, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. Acts 21.9. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So uh, this man particularly and four daughters who are prophetess. And 1 Corinthians 11.5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered dis dishonored her head. But that is even all one as if she were shaven. So it, uh, just showing here that uh, there were women prophetess, uh, prophets also. And that uh, Miriam was one of them. Uh, we don't know a lot about what she prophesied. Because uh, I don't have really have any references to anything that she said, but she did hold that role, and she might have acted in that way, uh, helping out uh, Moses. But we also know that Miriam had some kind of a pro prophetic gift. Later, she used her leadership position, though, in an unwise and ungodly way, to challenge the authority of Moses. And this is what I want to uh, kind of jump into. It's kind of an interesting, because uh, I see a couple of things that uh, point to here. Is one, number one, when God puts somebody in charge, we should honor that for sure. And the other thing is, is the fact that, that I'm going to point to it as we go by it, but that uh, it seems that God to, holds uh, discrimination in high regard when it comes to how you treat each, how we treat each other. Because one of the sins that Miriam is going to have, and she's going to uh, make a comment about Moses' wife. And who happens to be a, a certain nationality, and I think that's what the uh, what the basis of God's anger is. So let's read through this, and let's let's kind of dissect dissect it together. So November, uh, Numbers twelve one through uh, sixteen. Miriam and Aaron sp spoke against Moses. This is both of them because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Uh, let me back up just a second. This is not most common. To, most uh, theologians believe that Moses mo most likely married a second time. That his first wife, Sapphira, who was of the uh, Midians, because uh, her father was a, a Midian priest, uh, would have been would have been uh, from the descendants of Esau. I mean, not Esau, uh, Ishmael, uh, which would be Middle Eastern. But when, but the fact that they're pointing out Ethiopian woman here. Most likely she was a very dark complexion. And that's what, uh, it's interesting that they, they really emphasize an Ethiopian woman here. So I think what the basic complaint is, is that they're complaining that it's a mixed marriage, more or less. Verse 2. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. So here, it sounds like Mary is saying that, that, uh, that, uh, because of her position, that she feels that uh, she has a, the same authority that Moses has, and it's, that's what she's basically saying here: that uh, that haven't we spoken just like Moses has spoken, and the Lord heard it. So God overheard this conversation, and this is fascinating to me that uh, that He's going to step in, and how He steps in, in person, uh, well, in a cloud. So verse 3, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. This really kicks in with me because I'm, I'm somebody that has a lot of trouble uh, 
being very forceful with people. Uh, I never, that was one of my uh, weaknesses in the military. I had a lot of trouble uh, really uh, demanding things. I was, so I can, I can feel for Moses in his verse. Verse four. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came up. So God is going to have a private conversation with these three. Verse 5. And the Lord came down in a pillar of the cloud and, st and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. Can you imagine have God stand there, coming down and say, okay, Miriam, Aaron, come here. Need to talk to you. Boy, I would be shaking in my boots. Uh, we're talking about God here. <coughs> Verse 6. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, now I think here this is where he's pro he's talking about uh, Miriam. We found out she's a prophetess. I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. So what God is saying here is that he normally, the way he normally speaks to a prophetess or to a prophet is through visions and dreams. And now he's going to go on and say, but with Moses... Verse 7 here, let me read it first. My servant Moses is not so, who is a faithful and all mine house. So God is going to show us here that he converses with Moses directly, not through dreams and visions. But uh, it says it right here in verse 8. Still God speaking. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, meaning <coughs> like uh, person to person, where we can see each other. <coughs> even apparently and not in dark speeches. And dark speeches usually has an evil con uh, content to it. Like a, uh, they talk, at, in other words, that God had uh, favored uh, Moses in, in a high regard. So I think, again, the idea here is that uh, what they're saying about his wife is not the way God feels. <clears throat> and the similitude of the Lord shall, be, uh, shall he behold. Wherefore, then, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So here God is basically saying, weren't you at least worried the way you're speaking against Moses, knowing the kind of relationship he has with me? Verse 9, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. So basically, he basically turned around and left at that point. Kind of like uh, the old thing, uh, you know, if there was in an office setting, you might say, uh, Okay, I'm finished with you two. Leave, you know, and uh, get out of my office type of a. So if we're on to verse 10, now comes the punishment. And the and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. I find this very ironic because uh, she's probably, you know, she's, she's a Hebrew, so she's Middle Eastern. Uh, probably a, a, a little bit uh, darker complected, uh, maybe not all the way to what we call black, but uh, probably a medium uh, uh, olive color. And she became white as snow with leprosy. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Remember, Aaron is the priest. So the priest is the one that has to determine if somebody has leprosy. That's something that will come up when you study Leviticus. Verse 11. And Aaron said unto Moses, the lost, my Lord. So now Aaron is uh, uh, reaching out to Moses because we know Moses has God's ear. I beseech thee, lay not this sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we have sinned. So here's Aaron speaking up for the two of them. And let her not be as one dead. You, in that time frame, you died from leprosy. Of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. So Moses steps in, and he prays for her. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and after that let her be received in again. So this is God's punishment. She's going to be leprous for seven days. And the rule was for seven, if you were, you had leprosy, you had to be outside the camp, you had to be by yourself, and that you couldn't be uh, with others because it's very contagious back then. It's still in existence today, believe it or not. Uh, it's called uh, 
starts with an H. It's got a different name, uh, Hamus or Haman or, or something along that lines. And it's quite curable with uh, antibiotics, uh, but it still exists. And it just tears your skin up. You can uh, you can die from it pretty quickly. But I find it interesting too that uh, God decided on leprosy. And the reason this hit me is not because I'm feeling bad for her, but uh, just to finish my little testimony. First week of December, uh, 2015. Up until this point, I was I was attending church. I was playing what I, I was doing what I called playing church, and. Uh, Thought I was, uh, believed I was saved, and I, I still believe I was saved, but I was sure wasn't following in God's uh, path. I was still drinking alcohol. I was still doing things that uh, dishonored God's word. And I went into a situation where my heart went into a really bad arrhythmia. And uh, I think I've told this story before, but basically I was shocked, let's see, uh, four times at my house. Two more times on the way to the, uh, when I talk about I had a pacemaker that shocked me uh, to bring my heart back. And by the time I got to the hospital, I had just gone through a surgery where they eliminated a lot of my medications. And I'd hit the 30-day mark. And he thought, and the guy that did my last ablation thought I didn't need the medication, so he had taken me off of it. Uh, now, it might have been a man-made thing, but, uh, uh, but I believe God's hand was in this. And that, uh, he needed to get me back on the street and now because he had work for me to do. And then uh, so at the hospital, I'm in the emergency room and they're trying their best. They realize the problem now is I don't have enough uh, medication in me to stop the arrhythmias. I am getting hit every 30 seconds. To, I, I think the longest period between arrhythmias. Arrhythmia is when uh, your heart speeds up to the point where you have trouble breathing uh, and you can feel your heart racing. And typically, the, there's, two, there's a couple of ways of getting out of it. Either your heart just automatically comes out of it, or my pacemaker had to shock me. Uh, you've seen uh, those before with uh, the external type, the paddles. Well, I had one built into my pacemaker, so it was shocking me. And I was going through, uh, I don't know, I lost count how many times I got shocked uh, in the first few, uh, uh, probably about oh, five or six hours of this uh, while I was in the ER because they were trying to get me a room in ICU where they could give me a heavier medication to stop the uh, arrhythmias. They were having trouble finding me a room in ICU. And uh, so I was down there suffering through this and wondering when the next shock was going to come. And they finally got uh, enough medication in me, got me up into the ICU where they could give me the right kind of medication. And things calmed down. But I, I tell you, that whole week, the whole seven days, uh, before they got my heart fully settled down to where I could probably go home, uh, I was on I was on edge the whole week, and uh, matter of fact, I got to the point where I just laid motionless in my bed because it seemed like every time I moved, uh, my heart would go into arrhythmia again. So that's my story. But right after that, no more booze. That was out for sure. Uh, I I felt. So grateful that God had gave me a second chance because I actually prayed to God during that time to take me. Uh, it was that much of a traumatic experience. So this story got to me on that. And uh, so I just wanted to share that. But let's finish up here about Miriam. Let's see, where was I in my notes? <laughs> uh, oh, finishing up here in Numbers. So she's out. She's outside the camp with this leprosy, probably going through torture. And Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till uh, not till Miriam was brought in again. So they basically stayed there and didn't move uh, move uh, to the next spot for the whole period that Miriam was outside the camp. So they waited for her. And afterward, the people removed from uh, Hazroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. So that episode is over, and just to, just to continue a little bit on this. In verse 2 of that, um, I, guess, I just want to look at a couple of things in here. Going back to verse 2. Trying to say that there was also in charge when only Moses was spoken to directly is the sin she had, mostly. Uh, I basically spoke to all these while I was talking about it. 
that God had a special relationship. So I don't need to repeat it. We see one more reference to her as a leader in Micah 6.4. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So all three of them are, are attributed to the fact that they were the ones that are instrumental in bringing uh, everybody out of uh, the land of Egypt. So we can see her there also as a leader, the leader probably of the women. Uh, we saw her leading in that uh, verse uh, where she uh, uh, was leading the woman in song and dance. And she is grouped with a sibling as though she was brought out. Uh, she also assisted greatly in bringing out the children. So again, this was a, uh, God had to teach her a little bit of a lesson. And and uh, the old saying is when, uh, when God decides to take you to the woodshed, uh, learn that lesson uh, well so that he doesn't have to repeat it, <laughs> as the uh, saying there. So all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. On this occasion, Miriam led the women's choir. Uh, I guess I didn't put that in there. Exodus 15, 20. I meant to read that before I... And Mary and the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. I like this verse. That uh, would seem singing and dances considered worship and celebration. I'd be interested to see what kind of uh, uh, things we do uh, in worship when we get to heaven. Because uh, I have a feeling it might be slightly different than we used to uh, here on earth. I guess I mentioned it. it says a timbrel. A timbrel is what you think it is. Uh, it, it's tof in Hebrew, and in Arabic it's called a duff or a diff. And in Spanish it's called an aduff. Uh, it, is the tablet used in the east being a thin, broad wooden hoop with parchment extended over one side of it to which small pieces of brass, tin, etc. are attached, which make a jingling noise. It is held up with one hand and beaten upon the other, and is precisely the same as a tambourine. tambourine. Uh, and speaking about all the women, over in Judges 11.34, and Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughters came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside, beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. Just showing some other examples, but uh, this song and dance by the ladies is, uh, is quite common in the Old Testament. First Samuel 18, 6, And it came to pass as they came, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, see another celebration, they won over the Philistines, and David here is enjoying it in it. That the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul. I'm sorry, not David yet. With tambourines, with joy, and with instruments of music. So we see that was a, after a, a big defeat uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the, the Philistines. But also in 2 Samuel 6, and this is the David one, starting in verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on a manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on palmistries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And jumping over to verse 14. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. Psalm 68, 25. The singers went out. The players on instruments followed after. Among them were the damsels playing with timbrels. And Psalms 81, 1 and 2. And to the chief musician upon Githith, a psalm of Asaph. Sing aloud unto God our, our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a psalm and, a, and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the psalmetry. Quite lively dance. I think it was like uh, almost like line dancing, uh, where you're just celebrating, you're, you're just you're raising your hands up and enjoying yourself. Uh, probably a little bit like a uh, good old fashioned uh, uh, Southern Baptist uh, type uh, revival. <laughs> Psalm 149, verse 3. Let them praise his name and dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and the harp. 
And okay, moving on to verse 21 of Exodus. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his bride hath he thrown into the sea. So we got some references for this too. Sing ye to the Lord. Second Chronicles 5.13. It came to even to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard and praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. And of course, when uh, jumping into one of my favorite books in Revelations 5, 9, this is talking about us when we get up to heaven. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, speaking to Jesus. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. There's going to be a few of these singing new songs. Uh, Revelation 14, 3, the tribulation saints. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. No man could learn that song but the 144, no, this is 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. And also Revelation 15, 3. They sung the song of Moses. Okay, that's what we just talked about uh, yesterday, on uh, Friday. The servant of God, and they sung of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, the King of saints. And the last one, and the most glorious, and we'll, we'll stop here. Revelation 19, 1 through 6. After all these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven singing, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the whole great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication her, and hath avenged the blood of her servants of her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down, worshiping God and that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and the voice of many thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God um, omnipotent reigneth. So I'm going to stop there for today, and uh, we will move into the next stop on the uh, on this treasure hunt, going uh, do towards Mount, Mori uh, Mount uh, Sinai. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that little lesson uh, about uh, how God sometimes will use our own ailments at times to even try to uh, wake us up. Uh, I felt really led to, to share that. So I, I hope it wasn't too much... Uh, of my own story, but uh, I hope that uh, maybe my testimony might help somebody else. I don't know. The Holy Spirit seemed to lead me to do this today. So have a great day and let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for the for the blessings you've bestowed on me. And thank you, Lord, for those times you need to uh, uh, correct us and help us to see the way you see uh and to, and to be ready, willing, and able to understand that sometimes you have to use a, a heavy hand to get our attention. That we may learn from those experiences and be able to uh, continue on and realize that you're doing it because you love us and you care about us. And we thank you and praise you so much. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay, you guys have a great day, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.